Finishing a crossword is a daily ritual for millions across the globe. The classic word puzzle forces the solver to think outside the box, or rather, inside the box. The letters of a word must fit perfectly within those allotted spaces, and sometimes the correct answer can be head-scratching. But once you finally crack the code, it's no doubt a rewarding feeling. For more than a hundred years, people have been drawn to this daily game. The crossword was invented out of desperation. It was kind of an accident. Arthur Wynne, who is, was an editor at the New York World, that newspaper, he invented the crossword on December 21st, 1913. That's when the first crossword was published. He needed a puzzle to be published in his Christmas edition of the Sun supplement to the newspaper. And so he was, you know, in a jam. He needed something on the page, and, and he was just sort of stuck. And he thought, oh, a grid, a big grid. I can print that. That'll fill a lot of space. Terrific. Awesome. That's Adrienne Raffel, author of Thinking Inside the Box, Adventures with Crosswords, and The Puzzling People Who Can't Live Without Them. Today, cruciverbalists, the formal name for people who solve crossword puzzles, participate in crossword tournaments, online events, and also have fun creating their own word matchups for potential publishing. So what does it take to build out a crossword? Start with two main components, a grid, and clues. The grid, you got all your letters in their particular symmetrical space, and then once you've got the grid all filled in, which is really the sort of hardest technical part, then you have the clues, which are going to be this either straightforward or more difficult riddle-y kinds of answers to tell you how to fill in that grid. So part one is constructing a grid that all works together, and then once you've got that, part two is, what kinds of clues do I want to match that grid? And of course, it's not totally part one and part two. They kind of go together. You're thinking about cool clues as you're putting in your cool words into the grid. But you want to make sure that all the letters work before you start putting clues to them. In the early days, crossword grids were constructed manually. But today, computer software programs generate crossword grids and fill in letters. But that's as far as the computer can go. Humans must craft the clever clues. Crossword construction software, which has been developing over the past decade or so, that I would say nearly all crossword constructors use, the computer, you can click a button and the computer can fill in letters for you, no sweat. What a computer can't do is create the clues that go with those letters, or it can't, you know, or it can, but, you know, it won't sound quite the same. And also, it, depending on the list the computer is using, the computer might love some of those finicky, like, crosswordies kind of words, like Y-S-E-R, that, you know, human solvers get annoyed at. So computers can technically do it. The best human solvers are still better than the best artificial intelligence solvers, too. The most popular crosswords have a unifying theme, such as one long answer spread across three or four different clues, or a clever play on words. Think of bacon. Is it a popular breakfast food? or your monthly paycheck. While themed puzzles are the easiest ones to solve, Rafel says themeless puzzles can be extremely difficult. Themeless puzzles are ones where you're typically going to have like longer answers spanning the grid. I've grown to really love them. They can be really tricky because you don't have a central idea that you kind of get the gist of, and then you can fill in the rest of the crossword around that. But you can get really exotic, interesting words and phrases into a seamless puzzle. Many seniors solve crosswords religiously. With the critical thinking involved, people often wonder, does solving crosswords help prevent dementia? This is kind of a million-dollar question, and there's been a study that showed that if you do crosswords, you can keep dementia at bay, but you can't stave it off forever. And basically what the crossword and other similar games will help you do is the brain can find workarounds. You know, the brain can sort of compensate, and the crossword might help strengthen those, like, areas of compensation, but the brain is still aging at the same time. So you might be able to sort of kick the can farther down the road, push dementia farther. Many solvers assume crosswords are written by newspaper editors, but nearly all crosswords are created by freelancers. 
Anyone can try to construct a brilliant crossword. Riefel says the going rate for a daily puzzle in the New York Times is $500. For the all-important Sunday puzzle, the hardest one of the week, it's $1,500. You can get crossword construction software. You can try building your computer, and you just send it in. So the most seasoned constructors and the beginners all just send in new puzzles to the New York Times. So there are these communities on Facebook and elsewhere and social media where you can connect up with people who are more seasoned at constructing, and then you can just try it out and send it in. Everybody sends it the same way. And when it comes to solving these riddles, crucial verbalists often pride themselves on speed. At the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, which is a yearly tournament that almost usually happens at the end of March, last year... Dan Fayer was the winner. He's won several years. Eric Agard, Howard Barkin were also recent winners. I mean, they do crosswords, and, you know, uh, the hardest crossword of the tournament they'll do in, like, four minutes flat. They are incredible. It's as though they are just speed writing, you know? Like, I can't write that fast. Whether you're focused on speed, accuracy, or even just passing the time with a little mental exercise, a crossword puzzle never gets boring. You can learn how to construct a fun crossword in Adrian Raffles' book, Thinking Inside the Box, Adventures with Crosswords and the Puzzling People Who Can't Live Without Them, available online now. You can learn more about all of our guests by visiting our website at viewpointsradio.org. The story was written and produced by Polly Hansen. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. I'm Gary Price. This segment is brought to you by Capital One. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One N.A. Member FDIC. Coming up on Viewpoints. When you stretch your supply chains 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from Shanghai to Amsterdam, etc., you create so many linkages, so many transportation lanes, so many handlers, so many things that can go wrong. The long-term benefits of building a more resilient supply chain system. Then... People were really interested in cooking thematically. So people would throw yellow dinners and orange dinners and pink dinners. The Odd Recipes of Early Modern America. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints.